Hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and it's time for lecture number three in my series on the gross pathology of non-human primates. Today we're going to finish up on the multisystemic syndromes, or syndromes that routinely affect a, a predictable and wide array of organs. Uh, lecture one, we talked about the herpes viruses. Lecture two covered immunosuppressive diseases. And lecture three are going to cover a couple of other syndromes. This should be a much shorter lecture than the other two. Um, and we're going to talk about first amyloidosis and finish up with fatal fasting syndrome in macaques. As I do at the beginning of all my lectures, I want to thank my colleagues and friends who have provided me images either directly or through online collections that have made these little lectures possible. I'll say many times that the diseases of non-human primates are often those uh, associated with captivity and amyloidosis is certainly one of them. Reactive systemic amyloidosis is not uncommon in rhesus macaques, especially in the laboratory setting. And additionally, it's been reported in a number of other non-human primate species, including marmosets, squirrel monkeys, pigtail macaques, celebes macaques, sinos, stumptails, baboons, and chimpanzees. It is often seen in animals with chronic implants as a result of a low-grade inflammation resulting from that. Systemic amyloidosis is the result of inflammation, excessive production of TNF1, uh, interferon, IL-1, and a number of other cytokines by macrophages in areas of inflammation which cause an overproduction of serum amyloid protein by the liver and under the right conditions. This will polymerize in various organs of the body. Um, it's often seen in association with uh, various implants, skull caps, chronic vascular catheterization, as well as underlying conditions such as uh, various forms of osteoarthritis, retroviral infections, as we talked about in the last lecture, enterocolitis, and parasitism. When we look at the uh, organs that are affected by the deposition of amyloid, it's most frequently seen in the space of Desay in the liver, the lamina propria of the GI tract, the cortical medullary junction of the adrenal gland, in both the red and white pulp of the spleen, and within the renal medullary interstitium. Renal glomeruli are rarely involved except in some New World monkey species like marmosets. If we look at this particular section, there are two different levers I'm going to show you in this lecture. <clears throat> one associated with amyloid deposition, one associated with fat deposition. In this case, it's always difficult to tell in a two-dimensional picture, but this liver appears enlarged. It has markedly rounded edges, and it just has sort of a waxy, hard appearance to it. So if I snuck up behind you and whacked you in the head with it, I would probably knock you out and lay you out on the floor. It's a hard, large liver. On cut section, it also has that uh, sort of waxy, hard appearance, like it wasn't very difficult to cut, like a nice, hard piece of cheese. It does have sort of an orange appearance to it, like you might see in a liver with a lot of fat as well. So colors can be a little bit tricky when we're looking at uh, hepatic amyloidosis. Another commonly infected uh, organ with amyloid is the spleen. In human, these are known as lardaceous spleens. Just an absolutely beautiful picture. Amyloid can be seen both within the red pulp and often within the centers of the periarterial lymphoid sheaths. Now, not every case of amyloidosis is going to show these very nice lesions. Some you, There may be no gross appearance, but you will pick up the presence of the uh, amyloid uh, on histologic sections, and it's amazing how much amyloid can fit within the space of say without showing uh, a gross appearance. Uh, these preparations, when correctly stained with Congo red, 
and viewed under polarized light will often show a beautiful apple green birefringence, which is produced by the alignment of the dye molecules along the cross-linked protein fibrils. Another organ that is commonly affected is the kidney. These animals may be proteinuric, even though the uh, amyloid is most often seen within the, uh, uh, the cortical interstitium, especially along corticomedullary junctions. I've always found amyloid to be a, a relatively difficult, gross diagnosis. Um, the kidneys may look slightly enlarged. They may look waxy and the color is somewhat different but without architectural distortion uh, that can also, also often be a, a, a judgment call histologically it's not too difficult to make the amyloid will be uh, uh, readily available if the animal is proteinuric you'll see a lot of protein within the renal tubules another location reactive systemic amyloidosis. This commonly seen is within the uh, lamina propria of the intestine. The presence of uh, a lot of amyloid will crowd out uh, intestinal crypts and you will have a marked blunting of the villi and accompanying protein losing enteropathy and diarrhea. Uh, one of the more tragic papers that I have read in my uh, uh, career was published in VetPath in the mid-90s and detailed the uh, a colony of monkeys or of macaques which were kept in cages for the for most of their lives which were too short for them to stand up and as a result developed severe osteoarthritis of the hips and the knees and other joints in the body and uh, Ultimately, this chronic infection or chronic inflammation, not infection, resulted in systemic reactive amyloidosis, and the animals developed this form of intestinal amyloidosis and severe diarrhea, which eventually was uh, the cause of their euthanasia and discovery of uh, intestinal amyloidosis. You can occasionally see amyloidosis as a result of uh, type D retrovirus, like simian retrovirus type 2, which we mentioned yesterday. And when it's seen, should alert the pathologist to the possibility of that infection in the colony. There is another form of amyloidosis that we will talk about when we get to the uh, GI tract that is not associated with these uh, reactive systemic forms, and that would be uh, amyloidosis of the pancreatic islets, often seen in obese macaques. Uh, islet amyloid polypeptide is secreted uh, within the islets in these animals, and because it is toxic to the islet, eventually it sort of not only squeezes out the islet and replaces the cells, but is actively toxic to them as well. But it's not re associated with a systemic reactive. Uh, uh, amyloidosis, so I won't include it here. Okay, so if you still have the uh, picture of the amyloid liver in your mind, or you can stop the tape and go back and, and take a look, here is a similar picture, but the liver is sort of floppy. It's also orange, but has a greasy texture. And this is hepatic lipidosis. If I walked up behind you and hit you with this liver, you would just have a grease spot in the back of your head and you'd probably turn around and lay me out. Um, and this is a prominent sign in a condition known as fatal fasting syndrome of macaques. It is, this condition is usually seen uh, in obese macaques which undergo a stressful event and manifest with significant anorexia and weight loss. The condition may result in sudden death or may be a little bit more prolonged. And it is not easy being a laboratory primate. Uh, <clears throat> macaques and, and other non-human primates have very 
structured social groups and you cannot just move a, a macaque from one social group to another um, because it is a, a cause of significant stress and disruption, disruption, potential injury for the animal that's been moved into a totally new setting. And this is one of the conditions that might result uh, in a severely stressed animal. So we have uh, anorexia, significant weight loss, and, and mobilization of peripheral fat stores, which sort of flood the body. And so you start to see fat in a, a number of tissues, especially uh, uh, the liver, Remember that the fat will take in, or the liver hepatocyte will take in just about as much fat as presented. The problem is it takes energy, and it takes uh, takes a um, protein, a concurrent influx of protein, to complex it and to resecrete it back into the blood in the form of lipoproteins. And if these animals are starving, if they are protein starved, they may simply not have the protein reserves. To, uh, to go ahead and recomplex it. So easy to store liver and flood the liver with fat, tough to metabolize it and send it back out. And I showed you a cut picture of the amyloid liver, so I'm gonna show you a cut picture of this really fatty liver. And you can tell that it's just fat. If you were to touch it, it'd probably sort of fall apart in your hand. So this is hepatic lipidosis. And in obese macaques, I'm gonna think about a a tremendous environmental stress and fatal fasting syndrome. You're going to see a lipid throughout the body. The renal cortex is going to be very light. You will see a lipid within the renal tubular epithelium. You will see uh, uh, occasionally you will see lipid emboli within glomerular capillaries, and. Uh, the cortex just has a tremendous amount of fat. You'll also see a lot of fat in the adrenal cortex as well. And then if you look in the subcutaneous fat, it is largely mobilized. We have areas of oxidized fat down here, but those depots just start to melt and they, they go and they flood uh, the remainder of the body. You may also want to look for pancreatitis in these animals. Okay, well that uh, covers the two last multisystemic syndromes I want to talk about. Our next lecture we're going to begin going through the systems, starting with the cardiovascular system and looking at other classic diseases which affect laboratory non-human primates. Hey, thank you for your attention and I hope you have a great day.